Welcome everybody from again around the world. I'm Father Chris Alar coming to you live from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And it's still a bit snowy, but warming up here and in the Northeast, we got hit pretty good. But God bless all of you for taking the time to join us. Today, we are going to talk about something that is the main reason we are Catholic versus any other Christian religion. And, and if you're not Catholic, God bless you, welcome. But it's the reason you should be. And I say that with a lot of love. I'm not at all pointing fingers. I'm just saying this is the beautiful gift that God gives us and it's called the sacraments. And so I'm gonna give an overview of the sacraments and this is so powerful that I had a sacrament class for each of the sacraments in seminary. And so you are catechism students. I keep telling you, I'm taking you back to seminary. I pulled out my seminary notes. I went through it again. I put this together for you and I'm condensing in a whole semester into one talk today. We're gonna to focus on an overview of the sacraments and the sacrament of baptism and what you probably didn't know and what I have forgotten. So thank you for joining us. Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to give us that blessing of blood and water and that water of that baptismal grace renew in us renew in us our vows, renew in us our, our, our grace that has been given to us through the sacraments. And we ask all this in through the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, now, of all the religions of the world, and there are tens of thousands, and in fact, even Christian some say there's as many as 40,000. Which one is the truth? Which one? You can't have 40,000 different truths. It's theoretically and practically and scientifically impossible. You can't have 40,000 different truths. Now, each of those 40,000 religions, Christian religions, have a different truth. And if they didn't, they would be the same religion. So which of those 40,000 has the truth? Well, there can only be one truth. I go with the one that Christ started. Only the Catholic Church goes back to Jesus Christ. For 1,500 years, there was no other Christian faith. Now, what then makes us different than every one of those 40,000? The sacraments. And people say, well, Father, our church believes in communion, not in the real presence the way we do as Catholics. Father, our faith believes in different things. Well, yes, God bless you, but we're going to explain to you why you're Catholic today. And again, if not, welcome, please. All I ask of you is to open your heart to say, maybe the sacraments are the reason that I should look at the Catholic faith. That's all we're asking of you today. Open your heart. This is amazing. Now, <clears throat> We are the only one with the sacraments. And you know, we are actually commanded by God to receive the sacraments. Father, where does that say? Where's that in the Bible? Yes, we are. We, that's what makes us the one true faith because God commanded us to, to uh, receive the sacraments. And there's only one faith that receives the sacraments in the way that we do, especially the real presence. What do I mean? Well, John 6. The Eucharist, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Or that we must be born of water and the Spirit, that is baptism. John 6 is the Eucharist, I could go on. So these are what tells us so. And they say so, they are, that's where God is commanding us to receive the sacraments. So Christ tells, look at another one, even confession. Christ told the apostles, who you forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins you retain are retained. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23. Basically, these are Christ giving his authority to who? The priest to do what? Forgive sins. Now that grace comes from God. Please understand, I'm not saying the grace comes from them. But God uses the priest as a tool 
It's an instrumental part of what he established in his church. And there's a very important reason the priest is who he is, despite his sinfulness, and we'll talk about that now. The Catholic Church is the only one who has formalized the sacraments to guarantee grace. Yes, other people believe in ordinations in the uh, Anglican Church and whatnot, but in terms of guaranteed grace that we receive in confession or the Eucharist, this is uniquely Catholic. The Catholic Church is the only one who has formalized it to make sure that that grace is guaranteed for you, not by their own authority, or I should say yes, by their own authority, but the authority given by Christ to them. People say, Father, I am not into a religion made made by man. No, the religion was made by Jesus entrusted to man. I don't listen to the rules of men. Well, I don't either. I listen to the rules of Jesus, but given to his chosen men called the priests and the bishops. That's who he chose to give his grace through them to help us understand how to receive and do what God asks us to do. It makes perfect sense if you think about it. I just, there is nothing that gets me more fired up than the sacraments. These sacraments are it. These are the answer. This is even what we, last night we did first Fridays. Today at three o'clock we'll do first Saturday devotion. What is it based on? The sacraments, confession, holy communion. And, and, and wow. Okay, so, all right. So anyway, um, this is what we need. We need, this is the grace for salvation. You know, when somebody says to you, and I used to get stopped in Walmart, have you been saved? And I never really knew how to answer that. What do you say when somebody stops you and says, have you been saved? Uh, yeah. Why? Um, cause I believe in Jesus. Yeah. But you've been saved. When those people ask you, have you been saved? You say, yes, I've been baptized in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. I've received the sacrament of baptism. I have been saved. And as long as I stay true to those vows of baptism and living my Christian faith, I will have eternal life. Beautiful. All right. Perhaps we Catholics are like the laborers in the, in the, uh, remember the laborers, that parable where um, some of the laborers worked all day long. And at the end of the day, the owner sent a few other vineyard people, workers into the vineyard for the last hour. I always thought this was a fascinating parable. And at the end of the day, it came time to pay them. Well, the way our human mind works, the guys that worked all day expected to get more money than the guy who worked the last hour. Now, here's what's interesting. The owner paid those guys that worked all day the wage they had agreed on. He did not cheat them. So the people who came, they agreed that the owner that they would work all day in the vineyard and they would get this amount of pay. And he did, they got it. Now here comes these other few people and they worked the last hour and the owner decided to pay them a full wage too. And the first workers got angry. Now you can kind of see that, but the owner said, wait a minute. He said, I, did I cheat you? You know, this is Matthew, by the way, Matthew verse, chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. And so those who worked are kind of like, well, let, let me put it this way. This is probably a better way to put it. Those without the sacraments are like those who worked all day. It seems unfair that both group got the same wages. And yet we as Catholics get eternal life through them. So it seems unfair that we are given all this extra help, this sacramental help, this extra grace, this easier grace, so to speak. It's kind of like, whoa, that's the easy way. Yeah, that's actually what the sacraments are. You want to know the quickest, surest, easiest way? Father Mike talks about Mary and consecration. Yes, but it's still based on the sacraments. The sacraments are the quickest, easiest, surest way, and Mary leads us to the sacraments. 
This is amazing. The, the, the judge or the owner of the vineyard said, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own money? Did I cheat you? No. I gave you your money, but I wish to give these, although they've only worked an hour, this extra grace. That's like our sacraments. Here these people are laboring in the vineyard. And here we Catholics have the opportunity to get this, I don't want to say the word easy grace, but guaranteed grace. That doesn't need to be all day. It's, it's something that could be installed in an instant into our soul. Fascinating. And the others aren't being cheated, as I just said. I just, it's like the owner saying, I just gave something special to the other group. Basically, I didn't cheat you. I just gave something special to the group that came in late. And that's my choice as the owner of this vineyard. Sorry if you don't like it, but I have the right to do that. That is basically what God has done here with the sacraments. So we don't deserve it. Well, Father, what makes you as a Catholic so special? What makes you deserve this? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. We don't deserve to be born, yet we're born again when we're baptized. We don't deserve the bread we eat, but yet we are given the bread of life in the Eucharist. This is amazing. We are given all this and more in the sacraments. So let's look at our next slide that Brother Mark's gonna put up. Of all the religions, as I said, look at that. All the religions around the world, what makes us different and the only one like us, the sacraments. This is what makes us different. And they only come through the Catholic Church. God bless you for holding on to your faith. And again, please, I invite all of you who are non-Catholic, stay with us. All I'm trying to do is show you where there is so much powerful grace of God given through this as a gift. And I want you to have that gift. I'm not condemning you because you're not Catholic or you don't have these. I'm in saying, inviting you, come, look at these gifts that God gave. You might want to consider them. Praise be God. And so we keep going. Now, Jesus' words, basically when he lived, announced and prepared the world for what he was going to give the church. The mysteries of Christ's life are the foundations of what we would now get in the sacraments and what he would dispense in the sacraments. And through the ministers of the church, listen to this, quote, what was visible in our Savior has passed over into his mysteries of the sacraments. That was Pope Leo the Great. He said that way before there existed any other Christian religion. The Christian faith only knew the sacraments. There was no other faith of Christianity that denied the sacraments. So if Christ is going to start a church, I don't think he's going to say, I'm going to start a church, which he did, but I'm going to get it wrong for 1,500 years until Martin Luther gets it right. I don't think so. So when Leo the Great said this, it made sense. The sacraments are powers, he said, that come from the corp, come forth from the body of Christ. How do we know that? It's scriptural. Father, where is this in the Bible? All right. The sacraments are powers that come forth from the body of Christ. Scriptural, Luke 5, 17, Luke 6, 19, Luke 8, 46. I could go on and on. This is beautiful. All right. They are the actions of the Holy Spirit at work in the body of Christ, the church. That's what the sacraments are. They're not just symbols. They do something. And you know, I, I've, I've said this before, but you guys are my catechism students. You're our Marian students, and you're coming back to seminary with me. And one of the things they do is teachers keep repeating things to get you to stick with them. And you've heard me give you the definition of sacrament probably half a dozen times. I'm going to do it again. What is a sacrament? A sacrament does something. It's not just a symbol. It's actual grace. When you get it, if you're properly ready for it, the grace is guaranteed. Jesus promises. So what's a sacrament? It's an efficacy efficacious sign, meaning it does something, efficacious, of God's grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is instilled in us. Are you kidding me? Here is something that 
Jesus instituted gives to us by which to give us divine life? I don't think it's something we want to reject. And I think as Catholics, it's something we need to get regularly, even though, yes, we know the churches are closed, <clears throat> you may be quarantined, but remember, the Catechism 1452 tells us that if you are sick, quarantined, or, you know, whatever reason you can't get the churches closed, that you can make an act of contrition for forgiveness of sins or an act of spiritual communion to receive God in you like the Eucharist and then have the intent to come back to the sacraments as soon as possible. So you, you, you don't have to worry that I'm getting no grace. Yes, we can. And that was actually the topic of last Saturday. If you're watching me this week, but you didn't see last Saturday, I go into all that, and it's called How to Receive Graces During a Pandemic. And it's still out on YouTube. All right, let's keep going. All right, the sacraments are guaranteed. Now, before I show, have Mark show you the next video, you all remember your sacraments, hopefully, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, reconciliation or penance, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. Now, I found an awesome little clip, it's not even two minutes, that gives you a summary of those seven sacraments. Let me have Mark show you, Brother Mark, show you this quick video. Your spiritual life begins at baptism. It is matured at confirmation. Your soul is healed in reconciliation. Your body is healed in anointing of the sick. Families are made with marriage. The church is sustained with holy orders. And Christ is present in the Eucharist. The sacraments are what Christ did on earth. Christ told us we must be born of water and spirit to enter his kingdom. He desires us to receive his Holy Spirit. He forgives the sins of his children. Christ wants us to live in peace and to be cured of our ailments. He brings two people together and makes them one flesh. He called Peter to be our first pope and the apostles our first leaders, and he gave his flesh and blood to be received. Everything he did, he still does in the sacraments. Three sacraments give us the grace we need to be holy in this life and spread the gospel to the world. Two sacraments heal us when we are wounded, either in body or in soul. Two sacraments are directed towards the salvation of others, sacraments of vocation. The seven sacraments of our faith, the sacraments nourish our faith. They are not just to be received, they are to be celebrated. They are to be lived. We receive them in here, so Christ can be known out there. Okay, isn't that a good little clip to just give you a basic understanding, maybe a refresher for you or an introduction for your children? Beautiful, grandchildren. All right, now, the sacraments are organized into three categories. Let's have Brother Mark show the first slide. These are the sacraments of initiation. And what are the sacraments of initiation? They are baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Okay, so on those slides, basically, the faithful are born anew by baptism, you were born, that's why Nicodemus said, do I go back in my mother's womb? You're born anew, all right? You are strengthened in confirmation, and then you are nourished in the Eucharist. That's why the Eucharist is daily. It has to keep nourishing. You need food every day. Your body needs food every day to move forward. So does your soul. And so let's look at our next group on the next slide are the sacraments of healing. Now, to heal the soul is confession, penance. To heal the body is anointing of the sick. God leaves nothing out here. We are humans, we are body, soul composites. So to heal the soul, we have confession. To have the body, we have anointing of the sick. Almost everybody in this world believes in doctors, the healing of the body. Why wouldn't people believe in the soul? That needs healing too. So that's penance for the soul, anointing for the body. Let's go to our third category. Mark puts up the sacraments of service. And these are matrimony or holy orders. 
If you are married, your service is to your spouse and your family. If you are an ordained priest, like I'm trying to do with you guys, my goal in life, your goal as a parent is to teach your children, love them, provide for them. Uh, as a spouse is to be there in unity and bring new life in the world through your spouse. My service as a ho in holy orders as a priest is to get you to heaven. Now you should be doing that with your spouse and family too. But mine is to educate you in the faith, to know God more so you can love him more. And then when you love him more, you are able to get to heaven. And all of us have different roles. Um, we have some priests here through the role in suffering. We have other priests here that are, are bro brothers or priests here that are doing it through um, teaching. You have other priests and brothers here like Brother Mark who are doing it through their skills to bring you this live stream. And so we all have roles in our, 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 our daily function as religious to bring you to heaven. That's service. All right, now, all sacraments are directed to the Holy Eucharist. This is what Thomas Aquinas said. As their end, each of these sacraments lead us to the Holy Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. All right, so Christ has entrusted the sacraments to his church and only the church, not our bedrooms. Well, I mean, we live out the sacrament of like matrimony in the bedroom, of course, but that sacrament fully that the source and summit, the Eucharist is only in church. It's not to be father. I just pray to God in my room. That's a good start, but that's where I stop. No, you need to nourish that. Your body needs food daily. Your soul needs food, nourish it. And so a spiritual seal Let's talk about these uh, sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, okay? These, these put a seal, all right, on you. Um, the spiritual seal, in a way, it's also in holy orders too, there's a seal. And so it's a promise of divine protection. Whether or not you cooperate with that spiritual protection or not is up to you. Let's look at, um, before actually before I have Mark show the next slide, People often say, Father, that priest isn't holy. I'm not going to Mass right now. It's the only church anywhere around, but that priest isn't holy, and I'm not going. Well, there's a term in the church, now Brother Mark can put it up, called ex opere operato. The sacraments are ex opere operato. What does that mean? That is, the sacraments are efficacious, quote, by the very fact that the sacramental action is performed. In other words, by the very fact that the sacrament is done, it actually doesn't matter about the priest. It's Christ who is working the sacrament. The priest is just a tool. Now, yeah, it could be a broken tool, but a good craftsman that God is, he can work even through a broken tool because it is Christ who acts in the sacraments and communicates the grace. Remember, Jesus told St. Faustina, don't judge the priest in the confessional. I'll deal with him. You go to him. The, uh, the efficacy of the sacraments does not depend on the personal holiness of the minister, although it should, and we want that, and we have a right to that, and we should have that. But you don't say to yourself, well, I'm not going because I don't want to get the sacraments from him. No, you're getting them from God. All right? So this is, well, you know, and it's true too. The fruits of the sacraments do depend on your disposition. Well, Father, if you're saying it doesn't matter who the priest is, then it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Actually, the church teaches it does. So if you are to receive the fullness of the fruits of the sacraments, you have to be disposed properly, ready, in a state of grace. Don't worry about the priest. What God is saying here, worry about ourselves and what we are to be ready to receive this grace. All right? So for believers in Christ, the sacraments even if they are not all given and you don't receive all of them, are still necessary for salvation. Because we were born and baptized into the Catholic faith. This is the way God gave us to salvation. Well, Father, what about the pygmy in the rainforest? Yes, the pygmy in the rainforest can technically be saved, but if you've heard of my other talks, 
technically he will be judged differently than you and me, especially me. He will be judged on the natural law. He didn't have scripture. He didn't have the mass. He won't be judged by that. He'll be judged by what God put on his heart in the natural law. Did he follow it? Was he good to the graces he was given? Well, here's the point. You and me were given the grace of baptism and the sacraments and the Eucharist. And so they are necessary for salvation regarding us. To whom much is expected, excuse me, to whom much is given, much is expected. Don't let that scare you away. Don't say, well, then I don't want it, Father. You say, no, that's exactly why I want it because that's extra grace to get me to heaven. All I have to do is follow it. It's not that hard. It is not that hard. All we have to do is come to confession and humble ourselves a little bit. Now, <clears throat> why are they necessary for salvation? Because they confer sacramental grace, the forgiveness of sins, Adoption as children of God, conforming to Christ the Lord and membership in his church. You can't get any more important than that. Now, the Holy Spirit, he plays a part here. He transforms, heals us, and transforms those who receive the sacraments which are needed for salvation. So, sacramental grace is actually the grace of the Holy Spirit given by Christ and entrusted to his church by which divine life is instilled in us. And it's proper in every sacrament. If you haven't seen my Holy Spirit talk, that's up there on YouTube as well, his role. Now, the grace helps the faithful on your journey in life to holiness and assists also the church. Now, here's something very interesting. Do you ever complain about the church? Have you ever complained that the bishops aren't holy or that the priests are, are seem disengaged? Have you ever complained that, that the church has lost its reverence? Any of that stuff? Okay. How many of us have realized that part of that reason is because we're not receiving the sacraments? Because when we receive the sacraments, not only does it help you grow to personal holiness, it actually assists the church as well to grow in charity and in her witness to the world. That is what's lacking in the church today. So do you realize that some of us are going to be, well, not me because I, uh, sacraments are part of my daily life, but maybe not receiving them most properly, I could be accountable for? Or maybe, you know, um, uh, celebrating Mass, if I have something on my soul I should have confessed. So we're all going to be responsible. Let's live the sacraments so we can help our own church. Don't complain about Mother Church. Help Mother Church. And you can help her by receiving the sacraments. You never hear this. We don't even hear this from bishops. And we should. You want to help the church? Yes, Father. I'm praying for the church. Yes, but receive the sacraments too. All right, let's keep going. Next slide. Let's today, you know what? There is so much to this. I can't give you all seven sacraments today. So you're just going to have to come back. I had a sacramental class for each of the sacraments. Let's show Father, Brother Mark the first one we're going to cover today is baptism. So how to understand baptism, the sacrament of baptism. This is one of my favorites. It's the starter point. It's beautiful. Now, Let's look at baptism. To baptize means to immerse, but not just in water. The one who is baptized is immersed into the death of Christ and rises with him in new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Remember the church, dying you destroyed our death, rising you restored our life. Baptism. In the Old Covenant, baptism was prefigured. Lots of prefiguring in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Remember the water? It was seen as a source of life and death. In the desert, they needed water to live. The Ark of Noah, which saved by means of water. Believe it or not, you think, well, it killed by means of water. No, actually, uh, uh, Noah's family was saved by it. The passing through the Red Sea. That was the water that allowed Israel to be free from the slavery of Egypt. Us too, the slavery of sin. In crossing the Jordan, Israel was looking for the promised land, which is the image of eternal life. They went through the water. The Israelites went through the Red Sea to be freed from slavery. 
The Israelites went across the Jordan looking for the promised land. They crossed the water to find eternal life. A lot of this in the Bible. And the old covenant prefigurations find their fulfillment in Jesus. Well, Father, let's go to, let's go to the Middle East and cross over the Jordan. You don't have to. We got Jesus Christ. All right? At the beginning of his public life, Jesus was what? Baptized in the Jordan. It was the first thing he did. So what we have here, and then, and then go to the end of his life. On the cross, what came forth? Blood and water flowed out of his side. What's that water? The sign of baptism. This is what it was. It flowed from his side. What is the great command? The great commandment, fathers, love God and then love your neighbors a second. No, the great command. Jesus said, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So everyone is to be baptized, or who is to be baptized, is also required to make a profession of faith, or it doesn't matter. Do you realize we make our profession of faith every Mass in the Creed? I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all things, visible and invisible. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. These are our faith. And so part of baptism is professing that faith. Well, wait a minute, Father, if it's a baby, how does a baby do it? We'll get there. All right. Done personally in the case of an adult or by the parents and by the church in the case of infants, faith is professed. Hmm. Godparents, don't take this rule lightly. Don't take it lightly. Godparents and the whole church community share the responsibility for baptismal preparation as well as for the development and safeguarding of the faith and grace given at baptism. Hmm. Baptism is necessary for salvation, Father? Yes, it is necessary for salvation for all those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for it. So, Father, you're telling me baptism is required to be saved, but in the same breath, you're telling me a pygmy in the rainforest who is not baptized can be saved. You're contradicting yourself. No. If you heard what the church just said, and I just read, Baptism is necessary for salvation for all of those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed. Most all of us have had the gospel proclaimed. Now, the pygmy in the rainforest isn't, so as I said earlier, God will judge him on the natural law. But we can't go before our maker, having had the gospel proclaimed for us. Our parents grew us up in the faith, but we've left it. And we've outwardly rejected and then say to our Lord, well, wait a minute, the pygmy got in. You're just like the guy at the vineyard. The guy at the vineyard is going to say, wait a minute, how come the pygmy who just came the last hour, he got in? I've been, I've been here all day because we didn't accept the avenue God set before us to get to heaven. The avenue to get to heaven, if we've been proclaimed the gospel, is baptism. And if we've had access to the sacraments, we need to ask for it. This is so important. Now, does this mean, Father, I know you got me all discouraged because my, my son's left the church and you're telling me now he can't be saved? No, I didn't say that either. Because what we have to do is pray for them that the grace will be given. And if you've heard my other talks, the Diary of St. Faustina, 1698 and other places, God's going to give them an opportunity. So there's hope. The catechism tells us in ways known to him alone, he will provide the opportunity for repentance. The best thing that we could do, though, is prepare for that. That's why we have to have it. Now, there's a couple other ways that if you're not physically baptized, you can still be saved. It's called baptism of blood and baptism of desire. We'll get to that. Stay with us. All right. Now, Christ died for everyone 
So those who died for the faith, you know what? Let's talk about it now. Baptism of blood. If you end up dying for Jesus, even though you have not been to the sacraments, Father, my son's not been to the sacraments. Does he believe in God? Yeah. Okay, well, there's going to come a time where he's going to be given a choice to live or die for God. Now, not necessarily physically. Please don't write me a letter or to the bishop saying, Father Chris said my son's going to be executed for being a Christian. No, I didn't say that. As you can tell, I'm, 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 I'm starting to get a little bit tired of trying to answer questions of people saying that I said things when I don't. So I apologize for repeating things over. I just got to stress it so that people don't keep telling my superiors that I said something that I didn't. Uh, one letter came to my superior that said, Father Chris said Mary was not a virgin and that she had children. I'm sorry, I have never, ever said that. Yet I get a letter that says, Father Chris said Mary was not a virgin and she had other children. I'm offended what Father Chris said. Now obviously she confused me with something else or she confused me with something I said. So please, before you write the letters, please listen fully. God bless you. Most all of them are great. 95% are beautiful. Uh, but the others are causing me some headaches. <laughs> and so God bless you. You know what, though? I tell you what. If you are honestly trying and you're honestly questioning, send me the letter. I will answer it. And I'm glad you do. I just... No, I struggle a little bit with being told I said something, which I can promise you I never said Mary had other children and wasn't a virgin. So we'll get through it. But please don't stop watching. Please keep trying. If you do have a question, it might be a little bit late before I get to it. I am behind, but I will. I'll get back to you. So God bless all of you for that. All right, now, Christ died for everyone. So those who die for the faith are what they call baptism by blood, and they can still be saved. So, Father, you mean my son who didn't have the sacraments can still go to heaven? Yes. There will come a time he'll have to make a choice for God or not. And we pray that he makes that choice for God. It may be at the end of his life. It may be a spiritual death, not necessarily a physical death. But it's a baptism by blood, and we pray for this. All right, now, they, those who don't know Christ and the church, I go back to the examples of those who have not been ministered to. Those who don't know Christ in the church still under the impulse of grace and they sincerely seek God and strive to do his will can be saved without baptism. Now I've got the traditional Catholics, which I consider myself one, saying, Father, how dare you say you can be saved without baptism? I'm just telling you what the church says. This is right from the catechism. It's called baptism of desire. This isn't me making it up. Again, the catechism says those who don't know Christ in the church, yet still, under the impulse of grace, sincerely seek God and strive to do his will, can also be saved without baptism. It's called baptism by desire. So there is hope. But why risk it? Just have the baptism. It's the way to do it. So the intention, whether to in explicit or implicit, to be baptized, which we call the baptism of desire, opens heaven. God is not going to block somebody out who sincerely desires them and would have had baptism if they knew about it. What the worry that we have is, is those who it's offered to and just outright reject it. We need to pray for them. But we still have hope because God can work miracles at the end of lives or within a life. So don't give up. Don't give hope. Give up hope. So the church in her liturgy entrusts children who die without baptism to the mercy of God. So baptism is the key here. So I got one more short little video. They're going to have Brother Mark show. This one, again, is under two minutes. But this is one of the most awesome little summaries of what I've been trying to tell you about baptism. Let's take a look at this video. If you had to put the seven sacraments into chronological order, what would be first? The answer is baptism. This not only makes us adopted children of God and heirs to heaven, 
but also initiates us into the Catholic Church and grants us access to the rest of the sacraments. Like all sacraments, baptism has three elements that give it its unique character, matter, form, and minister. The matter, the physical sign, is water. Nothing can live without water. Similarly, our souls need the water of baptism to reach eternal life. This water is also a sign of the cleansing of our souls in God's mercy. Any water will do for the sacrament, whether it is holy water or even just bottled water. The form here is quite simple. The words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit are spoken while the recipient is in contact with the water. The minister is normally a deacon, priest, or bishop. This does not have to be the case, however. In times of emergency, anyone can baptize. Now imagine you witness a car accident. Someone's been seriously injured and an ambulance is on its way. If this person is still conscious but gravely wounded, a good question to ask is whether or not they've been baptized. If the answer is no, then with their permission, you may baptize them. So that's how baptism is performed, but why do we need it? Is it necessary? Baptism is absolutely necessary to enter into eternal life, as it allows us entrance into the Catholic Church by washing away original sin. God, however, is not bound by the sacraments, and can save through other means. These extraordinary means that God saves are called baptism of blood and baptism of desire. Baptism of blood occurs when a person who has not been baptized by water is martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism of desire is when a person, through no fault of their own, has never heard of Jesus Christ or his message. God can then decide to dispense his grace to that person, judging by their actions if they would have wished for baptism had they known of its importance. So that's baptism, entrance to the church. So isn't that a great little video clip? Again, I know I've said all this, and, and, and I know I also get letters, people are frustrated if I repeat things, but again, that's why I think rep repetition helps you to absorb it, to sink in, and to let you know, wow, that does make sense. And so God bless you, because I think that that helps us each time we go over this to sink in. That's how we learn, and, and we're so happy that you're here to learn with us again. I apologize, I just, just wanna make sure that people understand my heart. My heart is to help you not to battle and try to teach you falsehoods. When I get those letters that say, Father, you're teaching heresy. No, I'm not trying to teach you heresy, I promise. We're trying to give you the teachings of the church. Yes, that's the beauty, and that's the love of it. And so I always nicely write back to those letters, I'm sorry, there must have been a misunderstanding, and there always is. But God bless you, keep coming. As I said, I just want you to keep coming. All right. What are the effects of baptism? Baptism takes away original sin. This is why we need to have it right away. And all personal sins and all punishment due to sin. It basically wipes your entire slate clean. Completely. It's amazing. It makes the baptized person a participant in the divine life of the Trinity through grace. The grace of justification, which incorporates one into Christ and into the church. Does that sound unimportant? That's amazing. It's beautiful. It gives one a share in the common priesthood of Christ. When you are baptized, do you know you share in the three offices of Christ? Priest, prophet, and king. You are a priest, you are a prophet, and you are a king. Now, what do you mean, Father, I'm a priest? No, not a ministerial priest confecting the sacraments, but you share in the common priesthood of Christ. And that is making sacrifice. Like when you come to Mass, you can make the sacrifice with the priest. You can pray the chaplet, Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity, like the priest. Beautiful. Now, when you do this, we share in communion with the body of Christ. Why is that important? Because that's what heaven is. It's preparing us for heaven. It's beautiful. It bestows the theological virtues on us of faith, hope, and love. Those virtues don't come on our own. Those are virtues only that come to us through baptism. And we have the virtues of faith, hope, and love perfected in, in confirmation. So the sacraments are important, and we also receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I talked about that on a separate video. God bless you. 
for watching those too. A baptized person belongs forever to Jesus Christ. If you heard my talk on the Mass of the Walkthrough, I talked about the sign of the cross, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. And I said it's like branding yourself. Remember the cowboys, to identify their cattle, they would brand them and they would have a mark permanently stuck on them. When you do the sign of the cross, you're branding yourself and it's the same with baptism. When you get baptized, there's a mark put on your soul and an ontological, that's just a big name, for a real change in your soul. Your soul is changed. It now belongs to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Again, amazing. So a baptized person belongs forever to Jesus. And he's marked with that indelible seal, that character, and this ontological change. All right, now, this is a famous question. Let's look at our next slide, Brother Mark will put up there. Infant baptism. Many people are not baptizing their children today. This is infant baptism, the Catholic belief in infant baptism. This is a shame. I, I can't stress it now. This is a, a, a mistake not to baptize every one of our youngsters, our children, as soon as possible. The baptismal rite is not just a symbol of grace. As I said, it's a cause of grace, not a symbol. It actually causes the grace. And so this is powerful. Baptism confers the first sanctifying grace and those supernatural values, as I said before, takes away sin, punishment. You can't get better. Now, I think what's important is the church baptizes infants because, as I said a second ago, they're born with original sin and they need to be freed from the evil one and given the freedom which belongs to the children of God. Baptism impresses that Christian character on the soul that now allows all the other sacraments. Powerful. It's the grace to allow us to share in the divine life of God as his adopted son or daughter. You're now in God's family. You know, you may have heard me say the story when I was a little kid and I wanted a new family because I thought my mom and dad liked my sister better. And it was so funny because... My mom was actually helping me write a letter to the newspaper to find a new family. I was like seven. And my dad comes by and he says, huh, you don't change the family God puts you into. And he just walked away. And it wasn't too many years later that I saw the wisdom in that. You don't change the family God puts you into. And if we are put into a family that gives us the sacraments, we don't want to change that. God put us in there. That's the beauty of our faith. I, wow, can't stress how beautiful that is. You know, when you were born, you didn't choose what country you were born into. You became a citizen of that nation. We don't, you didn't choose it. You didn't choose to be English or German or American. You were born into it. It's the same here. You know, a lot of times as Catholics, we're criticized for infant baptism, saying that you, you need the born-again experience. And then when you're old enough, you can make the choice. Well, let's look at this. Basically, they say you have to first accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then you get baptized. The problem is, for them, baptism is not salvific. It's not a sacrament. It's only a sign of their conversion. It cannot be given in a salvific sense to many of those who believe in the non-Catholic faith what it stands for. Now, they say that it can't be given to somebody under the age of reason because they need to make that choice. You Catholics, you don't get that. Well, actually, I think Scripture gets that. They are leaving their children with original sin. We don't want to do that. Even original sin has some control or a lot of control of the evil one, even on a youngster. We want to free them. We want to remove that as soon as possible. 
Do you know the age of reason for children is only seven? So that means after seven years old, there's some responsibility for even children. They're old enough. I, I know at eight years old, I was old enough to know right from wrong. I knew it was wrong to steal something or to cheat, even at a young age. So we do, even as children have reason. And the church says after seven, you're now definitely of age of reason. So free that beautiful little child from the grip of original sin. So at baptism, you have the born again experience. The difference is it's now salvific. It now brings salvation. It's not just a symbol of a conversion. It actually brings salvation. And so let's look at our next slide. St. Peter, 1 Peter 3.21 says, baptism now saves you. It's salvific, not as a removal of dirt from the body, because, you know, you're being washed in water, but as an appeal to God for a clearer conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Interesting, huh? He says it saves you. Uh, remember that in Philippians, uh, the jailer whom Paul and Silas had converted? Now, this was in Acts 6, I'm sorry, it was Acts 16, 33, but it was a Philippian jailer. Well, anyway, in Acts 16.33, it says, we are told that the same, quote, the same hour of the night, he was baptized, talking about this jailer, with all of his family. Now, did it say all of his family except the infants? Did it say all of his family except the children? No. And Paul replied in 1 Corinthians 1.16, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, Stephanus. Again, the whole household would have to include children. Here's a quote I like. Let's look at our next slide. Brother Mark can put up. Thus Peter declared, I did baptize excuse me, I'm sorry, Peter declared, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children. Father, you crazy Catholics baptize infants, they need to be old enough to make that choice. Point to Acts Chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Right there, Peter says, for this promise is to you and your children. So in the Old Testament, if a man were to become a Jew, he had to believe in the God of Israel and be circumcised. Now in the New Testament, if you became a Christian, you must believe in Jesus and be baptized. So Old Testament, to be a Jew... You had to be circumcised in the New Testament to be a Christian. You had to be baptized. Now, here's the thing. Those born as Jews who were becoming the first Christians were circumcised in anticipation of the Jewish faith when they were, before they were Christians, so that they would be raised in the Jewish faith. So they were circumcised in anticipation of being raised in the Jewish faith at eight days old. Hmm. Paul notes that baptism has replaced circumcision. That's uh, Colossians 2, verse 11. So let's look at this here. Usually, only infants were circumcised. Only infants were circumcised under the old law. Circumcision of adults was very rare. There were very few converts to Judaism. They circumcised the infants. So if Paul said baptism is replaced circumcision, he would be talking about infants. If Paul meant to exclude infants, he would not have chosen circumcision as a comparison. <laughs> it would have been a really bad comparison. So we can see this. How about our other church fathers like Augustine? St. Augustine, a church father, when there was, again, 
only the Catholic Church. He said, the custom of Mother Church in baptizing infants is certainly not to be scorned, nor is it to be believed that its tradition is anything except apostolic. So he's saying it comes from the apostles. Apostolic. All right, let's look at our another slide. This is from the apostolic tradition back in the 200s. The writing, the apostolic tradition. Quote, baptize first the children. And if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. That's exactly what the Catholic Church does today because it's been a tradition of the church for almost 2,000 years. That's amazing to me. <clears throat> but many non-Catholics try to ignore all of this historical writings. How do you just ignore that? How do you just ignore that the church fathers and the apostolic tradition say to baptize the little children? You just throw it out? No. These are the early church writings clearly indicating the legitimacy of infant baptism. All right. There is no doubt that the early church practiced infant baptism. None. And that's why we should too. And no Christian objections were ever voiced until the Reformation. There was never an objection to infant baptism till after Martin Luther. So we need to pray on that. All right, let's keep going. What is the meaning of a, a name when you have a name? My name is Chris. His name is Mark. What was the meaning of a name? Okay, a name was important because God knows each of us by name, and that's what makes us unique as persons to one another and to God. Now, in baptism... A Christian receives his or her name in the church, like maybe you're named after a saint. Now, Christian names were given for two purposes. Your first name was to distinguish you from other people, and your last name was to distinguish your family from other families. Now, today in our secular society, when people name their children, few think of the church. They just pick a name they like because everybody has a first name. Everybody has a last name. But do you know that the first name was given to the person at baptism? That is where they were christened. That was the tradition. That's where we come from. Fascinating. So we don't even hold to these traditions anymore, realizing where the naming of a child used to come from was their baptism. That's how important it is. Now, I mentioned before about baptism being needed for salvation. And I said, if somebody asks you if you've been saved, you want to say yes, because now you are adopted sons and daughters. But do you know that that makes the power of Divine Mercy Sunday like a second baptism? Salvation is powerful because Divine Mercy Sunday says basically, all right, if you've messed up since your first baptism... God's going to give you Divine Mercy Sunday like a second baptism to renew and clean your soul. It is not a second baptism. We're only baptized once. But Divine Mercy Sunday is like a second baptism. Wow. Powerful stuff. All right. It wipes away all sin and punishment, just like your first baptism. So it's like a second baptism. All right, and we know that it's needed. Mark 16, 16 says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. All right, we're coming close here. John chapter three, verse five says, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. So please don't get upset with Father Chris. You need to see this message from Jesus himself. And that's the beauty of it. That is why I am so dedicated to the Catholic Church. So much so that I became a priest. Because everything I know I'm being taught is of God. And that tells me everything I need to know. So as I said, don't despair though. 
Even if there's not baptism by water, there's baptism by blood and by desire. But again, don't risk it. Get there. Get the grace. Go for the guarantee. All right, next. Let's take a next. That's something important. To fully receive, we need to receive our sacraments, and we need to have, Mark will show it on the screen, form and matter. This is just a technical term we learn in seminary. If you guys want to come to seminary with me, this is one we got to learn. It's a little more technical, but I think it's fascinating. We receive fully the sacraments, and the sacraments to be valid need to have both form and matter. What does that mean, Father? What's the matter? Okay, let's talk about this. What does a sacrament require? All right, all sacraments need to have a minister. That's the guy or the person who intends to give you the sacrament, like a priest or a deacon or a bishop. Now, there has to be an intention, though. You know, uh, my friends in Buffalo told me that there was a possible Eucharistic miracle um, like a month ago in the Buffalo Diocese where a host was bleeding, appeared to be bleeding. And so everybody was all excited that we might have a Eucharistic miracle. It looked like there was blood on this host, but then it came out that that host was off to the side and the priest admitted, God bless him for telling the truth, he said, I did not have intent to consecrate that Eucharist. So for instance, if a priest is at the altar and there's a host that got left underneath the altar cloth and the priest does not know it's there and he says the mass with the host on the altar, he only has the intent to consecrate that mass or that uh, host. That other host is not consecrated. He didn't have the intent to consecrate it. So we have to have intention, that's first. Now, sacraments are not magic spells. They're not just these magic words or pieces of bread that have power in themselves. What the sacraments are, are moments in which God grants the privilege of allowing us to participate in his plan of grace and getting that grace. Man. We are participating, but, you, but the, the minister has to have the intent. For instance, I'm a priest. I have the intent to consecrate the host, or I have the, the intent to baptize your child. But if I wake up and I'm sleepwalking, I know this is a crazy example, but if I wake up and I'm sleepwalking with a bottle of water and I'm drinking it, and I walk up to you and I'm in the middle of the, a sleep, but I'm sleepwalking, and I pour that water over you, and I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I have done exactly what a baptism says, and I'm a priest. Is that person baptized? Actually not, because I didn't have the intent. You have to have the intent. And so this would not be valid. But in addition to intention, we need a minimum of something called form and matter. That's what the slide was. What is this? The form and the matter are the how and the what. For instance, form is what is said. So in baptism, the form is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the words, that's the form. But you also need matter. What is the matter in the sacrament of baptism? Water. These two things have to be present. We have to have the matter, the water, or it's not valid. We have to have the form. I have to say exactly, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why? Father, the church making all these rules. This was the words of Jesus Christ. The form is what he said. The matter is what he used, the water. So not everything, though, that normally occurs in a sacrament is required. For example, at a baptism, don't we also have nice symbolic things which are important to, to use, like candles, the white gown? Yeah, but they're not sacramental matter that can't be done without it. You could actually still have a baptism, although you don't have a christening gown. Or I can still baptize you whether or not there's candles. 
So those things are symbolic, they're nice, but you got to have the water and the words. Now, let's go into this what and how of baptism. So we said what is required is the matter, water. And the form consists of, and let's look at our next picture. There's the infant. What's being said? The priest has got the matter, the water. He's pouring it on the head of the baby. What's the form? He says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It has to be exactly that. And he pours it on the baby's head three times, once for each of the persons of the Trinity. Now the person can be immersed three times inside a dunking of water. The Catholic Church accepts that, but it's not required. So we have to realize that. And the other things like the vows of rejecting Satan. Father, my baptism wasn't valid. I didn't say the vows of, the ba of rejecting Satan. Well, neither did the child. The godparents say it on his behalf. So the, the baptism is still valid. The presence of a godparent, that's tradition. We want to have them there. But a baptism can be valid without that. If you come to somebody at a scene of an accident, if I'm a priest and I get out to baptize, and they're dying... I don't have to say, you know, we got to go find you a godparent. I baptize. Um, you know, the same thing with the gown and the candle. But anyway, the baptism to be valid, all you need are those two things. Now, please note that the form must be followed exactly. I cannot say in the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifier. I can't do this. You all hear about that deacon in Detroit? that has been baptizing other children. And, 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 and that isn't the problem. It would be the other sacraments, uh, like marriage. Um, he found out he wasn't validly baptized because he found a video of his baptism and the priest used the wrong words. So he went to the bishop and said, oh my, I'm not validly baptized. Now, if you find it out for a fact, yes, you should address it, but please don't worry. You, you, God knows, and you have to trust that, you know, I don't know the words from my own baptism, but God knows I trust that they were correct. So don't worry too much about that. All right, now, let's go to the next one. Who can baptize? Let's look at our next slide. Who can baptize? All right, our slide tells us bishops, priests, and deacons in the Latin rite, and in times of need, anyone. Check this out. This is a surprising. Even non-baptized persons can, be for, can perform the baptism with required intention, meaning they have to intend to do what the church asks of us. So, very interesting. Baptism is vital to salvation, so the church allows a lot of freedom in who can do it. The ordinary ministers, as I said, are priest, bishop, and deacon. However, anyone can baptize, anybody, leading, however, to some factors you got to condition, or conditions you got to factor in. For instance, it shouldn't be just because you want to. It should be in cases like emergency or death. Otherwise, it should be through the priest at the church. Now, for instance, Protestants who come into the church, they may not need to be rebaptized uh, because they were already baptized in some sense if they were baptized with the same formula in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The church would consider that valid. It need not and cannot be received twice. The only reason you would baptize them coming into the church if they were never validly baptized to begin with. Now, further, it is preferred but not required that baptisms happen on Sundays or on the Easter vigil. If you want to baptize a grandchild or a child, try we should try to do it on a Sunday or at the Easter vigil. Also, the person being baptized, as that slide showed, doesn't have to necessarily be, be Catholic. They don't even have to be baptized Christian. This is how serious the sacrament is. It's so serious that God wants them to have it. And he opens it up to just about anybody to even do it for them. Now, as long as they intend to do what the church believes to be true, 
when they are pouring the water and saying the formula in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means they have intent to baptize, and the sacrament then would be valid. All right? So normally, baptisms done by a layperson would only be done in cases of emergency, as I said. That's important to keep in mind. All right? If there was no grave need, then you shouldn't be rescheduling or planning to do it on your own. A priest should. And if you do do that, is the, pre, is the valid, excuse me, is the um, baptism valid? If you baptize your child when you didn't have to, is it valid? Yes, but it's illicit. Which means it's technically, it's technically acceptable, but it was faulty. So you don't want to do this. So this is the reason, don't go around just baptizing people at a party. <laughs> you know, I heard Father Chris, and he says it's acceptable. I want everybody here at the party to come and get baptized. No, it's not what we want to do. Um, you know, in fact, why not? Well, for one thing, the church names the ordained as the normal ministers for a reason. Because this way, they know what needs to be done and done correctly. When it's baptized by a priest, he knows exactly what to do and do it correctly. Unlike a grandma, no matter how good her heart is. Again, except in the cases of death or danger with the baby. Now, as the minister, the priest or the deacon, they have the responsibility that the person they are baptizing, and if they are parents or of an infant, desires it. So if I baptize an adult, I have to make sure they desire it. And if I'm baptizing a baby, I need to make sure their parents desire it. So this is another practical reason that the church requires a minister to do it. Another reason is because there's got to be a record. If you just baptize your granddaughter in the bathtub, there's no record of it. And those records are very important. So we know what other sacraments can come from it. Um, and if one uh, who's baptizing another is not the pastor of the local Catholic church, they have the responsibility to contact that pastor and tell him. So again, baptism is not just a symbol. It's truly something critically important. All right. So we got two last little things here. Now, let's look at our last couple slides. Where can a baptism be done? People don't think about this one. In a church, well, that's the obvious answer, Father. But again, unless there are reasons or dangers or emergencies. Again, it's done in a church because that's where the records are kept. And a parent may baptize, again, at home, somebody who's really sick or may not survive, but then they have to inform the church. So it's a gift from the parent to the child when they baptize, but it's also a gift from the church to the parent to be able to do so. So we need to follow those rules. So situations like that are why the church does allow more than a priest to baptize, especially, as I said, when needed. So if someone was validly baptized, prior to getting baptized in the church, we should let the pastor know, um, the deacon know. Because then they can still do the ceremony, but they do it a little bit different. It's called a conditional baptism. All right, so bottom line is this. Why are the sacraments so important? Well, hopefully everything I've said here today to you makes sense. You know, the Holy Spirit is acting through the sacraments. It's a way to give us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the church. And the church, in return, gives us the sacraments. Do you know St. Augustine said, what the soul, and you know what, let's, let's look at the next slide. Talk about the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this is where you hear the term baptism by fire, kind of like somebody who's thrown into a new job, or baptism by the Holy Spirit in some kind of the charismatic movements. Let's talk about that. The Holy Spirit, as I said, is key here. Augustine said this, what the soul is to the man's body. All right, here's 
me a man's body. And what the soul is to me is what gives me life. Do you know that even animals have souls? Do you know plants have souls? Father, you're heretical. Father, uh, I'm writing to Father Kaz. I'm telling him you're teaching heresy again. No. Animals have souls. Plants have souls. Anything that's alive has a soul. They're just not rational, immortal souls. Only the human being has a rational, immortal soul. But anything alive has a soul. It's just not rational or immortal. A plant can't add 16 plus 36 to get the answer. It doesn't have a rational soul. And a plant's not going to live forever, but a plant is alive. It has a soul animating it. So this is what we teach in the Catholic faith. This is Thomas Aquinas. Now, Augustine said, the soul is to the man's body what the soul is to the man's body. The Holy Spirit is to the body of Christ, which is the church. So the Holy Spirit gives life to the church just like your soul gives life to your body. Think about it. The church needs to have a soul to live. And that soul is the Holy Spirit. Then he says the Holy Spirit does in the church what the soul does in the members of its body. And what is that? It gives it life. And how does the Holy Spirit give life? The sacraments. This is the whole reason we're here. So the sacraments are critical because they are from the Holy Spirit. Cardinal Newman said, Holy Church in her sacraments will remain even until the end of the world. And, to, and what do those sacraments accomplish? They give us guaranteed grace and eternal life. You can't get anything more important. And so how does this all come about? Through the imposition of hands and inviting the welcoming of the Holy Spirit. This is how the church does it. Pope Leo XIII, you all know my favorite pope ever. He said, this awesome reality, although certainly a work of the whole blessed trinity, we still come to him and make our abode with him, John 14, 23, is attributed to the Holy Spirit. He's the giver of life. That's what we say in the creed. The Holy Spirit, the giver of life. Wow. So you and I have access to the triune God. Listen to this. If I could say one thing that is going to blow my mind if I was listening to a teaching on the sacraments. And I'll tell you how I say this is because it's a true story. I was sitting in one of my sacraments class at Holy Apostles. And the Dominican priest, Father Mulcahy, said, I think it was baptism. No, it might have been the Eucharist. Um, well, anyway, whichever sacraments class it was, or subject we were covering in that sacraments class, Father Melchie, he said something that I'll never forget. You and I have access to the Trinity in ways far greater than the apostles and the disciples that followed him. Because we have the fullness of the sacraments. That's beyond comprehension. And we're not going to jump on that. We are not going to grab that. We are not going to cherish that. Amazing. We have greater access to the Trinity in a greater way than the disciples of Christ. It's amazing. The ones that walked with him, the ones that followed him, the ones that were there 
as he multiplied the bread and the, and the wine, or made, uh, excuse me, multiplied the fish and the loaves. St. Augustine put it this way, the giving or sending forth of the Holy Spirit after Christ's glorification was to be such as had never been known before. Let me see that again. For that giving and sending forth of the Holy Spirit after Christ's glorification, which means after Christ died and resurrected, was to be such as had never been seen before, meaning we have greater access to the Trinity. And notice I didn't say just Jesus, the Trinity. Because I think what Father Malkehi meant was the whole Trinity, if I read my notes correctly. The whole Trinity, we have greater access to the sacraments today because the Holy Spirit, after Christ resurrected and ascended to the Father and is seated at his right hand, that ascension allowed then the Holy Spirit to come down upon us after the death of Christ. He's now glorified, ascended to the Father, and that opened up the floodgates, the wellspring of his mercy, and down showers upon the world is the grace of the church, the blood and the water brought forth that was the birth of the church and the grace given through the Holy Spirit. Incredible. Pope Leo said, that which now takes place in the church is the most perfect possible. Guys, we have something that the saints longed for in a way that we have, or I should say, the people before Christ, the patriarchs, the the people that we read about in the Old Testament, David and Moses. We have something that they only longed for. We have the sacraments. Cardinal Newman said, The Spirit came to finish in us what Christ had finished in himself, but left unfinished as regards to us. What? Say that again. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came to finish in us what Christ had finished in himself, but left unfinished in regards to us. That's why Jesus said, I must ascend to the Father or you're not going to get the paraclete. And what did the paraclete bring? The sacraments. Christ finished it, but through the sacraments. I know I'm going to get a letter saying, Father, you're heretical because you're saying Jesus didn't do it all. You're saying Jesus didn't finish it all. Uh Uh-uh. Notice my last line. Christ finished it, but through the sacraments, through the Holy Spirit. This is church teaching. This is not me. This is church teaching. And so we have once and for all, this is what Cardinal Newman said, once for all Christ hung upon the cross and the blood and the water issued from his pierced side. But by the Holy Spirit's ministration, The blood and the water now continue flowing forever. The sacraments. When Christ ascended to the Father, do you think he was going to leave us alone? Do you think he was going to leave us without his grace? How did Christ give the grace when he has now ascended to the Father? He's not there like he was with the apostles. But he left us something better. He left us, not better than him, please, please, oh my, (laughs) not better than him, better than it was before the coming of the Holy Spirit. Remember, I'm not comparing the Holy Spirit to Jesus here. They work together, they're the same God. And now we have in this the answer. It's in the sacraments. (laughs) God bless all of you. You guys are amazing. You guys who keep writing to me saying, Father, we're excited to go back to seminary with you. You just went to seminary. You just got an entire semester of baptism. 
I learned all of that an entire semester and I did my best to condense it for you. I hope it made sense. And God bless all of you for being willing students. Our Marian helpers, you guys are amazing. And I'm so grateful and honored to be teaching you this. But I can't think of anything more important. I really can't. And so you guys joining us is a gift of grace. Now on the last slide, Brother Mark's gonna show, is help join fully in this mission. Become a Marian helper. Become a Marian helper. There is no cost micprayers.org. It takes 10 seconds. Sign up if you already aren't one and start sharing in the graces of the sacraments. Because as a Marian helper, you will share in the grace of all of our sacraments, our masses, our prayers, our penances, just like you were a Marian of the Immaculate Conception. This is incredible. And I'm going to have Brother Mark show at the end of this talk a quick clip because I also want to invite you to get a copy of my new book. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy. A lot of what I talked about is in this and all of these explaining the faith talks, especially about divine mercy. I've always wanted a book that I felt would be a one-stop shop, a one place to go to get everything about divine mercy you need to know. And I hopefully have done that. I'm not sure, but we'll show you a quick clip on this. If you'd like to get it, you can visit shopmercy.org or call 800 462 seven four two six and again please get a copy of my new book it tells you everything how to receive the graces of divine mercy what divine mercy is how you receive what to do on divine mercy sunday what two simple things to receive the extraordinary promise i explain the feast of divine mercy the image the novena the chaplet the hour all of that and why would a good and loving god allow suffering if he's merciful it's all in there so God bless all of you. We are so happy and stay with us next week because we're going to continue our discussion on the sacraments. Why is this important? They are what get us to heaven. They're all Christ-based. They are nothing that takes us away from Christ. In fact, they are Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, they are perfected. And they all came from God the Father, from which comes all everything we need to get back to enjoy forever heaven. God bless you, and may Almighty God and our blessed Mother Mary keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Father Chris Aylar, and I'm excited to tell you about the completion of my newest project. It's been a long time in the making. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy, my new book for Marian Press that finally in one place, I feel, gives you the, all the answers of everything you need to know about God's divine mercy. In fact, it answers what is divine mercy, who is St. Faustina, and what message did God give her for the world? How about the Feast of Divine Mercy, and what do you have to do to receive the graces that Jesus promises on this one day of the year? We talk about the meaning of the image, and how to pray the Novena, and how to understand the chaplet, and what to do in the hour of mercy, and much, much more answering questions like, why would a merciful God allow such suffering? So please, we hope that you'll pick up a copy of this book for you and your loved ones, because if you get the understanding of what God's mercy is, you will understand why Jesus said it's mankind's last hope of salvation. So please visit us at shopmercy.org or give us a call at 800-462-7426. Thank you, and may Almighty God bless you.